Alhamdulillah, once again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed me to be able to um, come to you and discuss and learn a very important topic. The life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a mercy to mankind, the has all kinds of names, El Amin, Mustafa, all of these different, these beautiful attributes that describe the the the, the characteristics of our beloved Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What we did is that last week, just to kind of give a little bit of a um a refresher, what we did last week is we talked about the history of the Arabs prior to Islam. And um, what I tried to do is I tried to sift through It's a lot of different stuff as it related to the lineage, you know, uh, the different types of Arabs, as it related to, to people like the odd people. Um, and then we talked about Arabized um, Arabs. And this is the the um, I would say more so for us to be concerned about, because this is the line stemming from Prophet Ismail. Alayhi salam. <clears throat> OK. And so we know that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam springs from the lineage of Ismail. Uh, may Allah um, give him the highest place in Jannah. And so we also talked about um, his, uh, how Prophet Ismail, his wife, his, I'm sorry, his mother, Hajar, um, landed in Mecca. This was a, a, um, a, 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 uh, a ruling from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or a commandment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to leave them in this valley. And to this day, when all of us who have performed Hajj running between Safa and Marwa, this is like a reenactment of the um of, of what uh Hagar did or Hajar, what she did in terms of trying to find water or find somebody because of the fact that Ismail alayhi salam was dying. Of, of hunger and of thirst. And so we know that Mecca was centered and formulated around Zamzam, alhamdulillah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for the angel Jabril to come and to strike the ground. And from that, um, water came from it. And then the tribe of Jurhum came, they made an agreement with her. And then all of these people started to formulate. So actually Mecca itself was, was built around Zamzam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given the order to Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail to construct the Kaaba. And alhamdulillah, just a fun fact, the Kaaba didn't look like it did now. You understand? It was more rectangular and it was a little bit in terms of more, um, uh, uh, and it didn't have a roof. You understand what I mean? And so what ends up happening is, is that the, um, the religion of Prophet Ismail and the traditions of Hajj was, was there. And so remember what we said is that the Arabs themselves, they were practicing the religion of Ismail. And as time went on, things started to become diluted, right? And so you have, and this is what happens when you don't stick and hold on to the traditions of your religion, then shaitan comes and can add a little bit of this, and then a little bit of that, and a little bit of this, and all you have is a little bit of, of, of the original, and then you have hardly nothing of what was meant to be in the beginning. And so another thing that we talked about was the uh, when the, the Quraysh had gotten a hold, they were the keepers of the Kaaba, and they had gotten a hold of this particular responsibility. And then the Kaaba or Hajj itself, the pilgrimage itself, it started to become commercial. And going back a little bit from that, we talked about a person by the name of Amr bin Luhay. This is a person who was highly regarded in Meccan society. He was charitable. He was a person who was supposed to be religious. He was the leader of his tribe. And 
as we established, the Arabs were not uh, industrial type people. They were traders. And so they would trade to different places. They would go to Egypt and they would go to Syria and all of these in, um, in Persia. And they would go and they would trade. What Amr, what he did is he brought back these traditions. He saw people worshiping idols in Syria. He brought back the traditions of this. He placed an idol in the, in the center of the Kaaba, and he had asked people or encouraged people to worship these particular idols. And we know that when the Prophet Wasallam had ended up coming and taking over Mecca, that over 360 idols were there. Now, the mindset of the Arabs was that they believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they believed that you had to worship these idols in order to be like some type of intermediary going to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we know that we have, as Muslims, we have a direct line to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't need to go through anybody or anything in order to get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so therefore they had these traditions they, and it was more so, I like to use the word traditions because the society was not religious. So subhanAllah, if we can draw a comparison and when you're reading as we go through this journey and we draw a comparison between what's going on now and what's, go what's going on during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, you had uh, people who adultery was rampant, fornication was rampant, gambling was rampant. They had these situations where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Muslims that in terms of the, the kufar, as they slaughter and they meet on these um, these, uh, these stone altars, and they would say in the name of Lot or Uza or Hubal, and so on and so forth. Also, some of these traditions or these superstitions started to come where Allah calls, uh, tells us that um, these uh, this tradition of you couldn't eat a certain type of sheep or a certain type of camel because of these traditions that Amr bin Luhay had brought also brought to Mecca. And, and, to ref, uh, uh, and also the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what he said was that he had a dream that he saw that this particular person who brought these evil practices to Mecca, he saw, he saw him in a dream dragging his intestines in a hellfire. So what happens is that we start to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially in the Meccan phase, a lot of these, these superstitions, these traditions, all these things are starting to be broken down. They're starting to be challenged, right? And so um, even when the Quraysh had gotten a hold as the, the keepers of, of Hajj or the people hosting Hajj, that it got to a point where they would make people wear uniforms. And if they didn't, if they could not afford these uniforms, then the people would go around the Kaaba naked, a'udhu billah. And then the women would also just have a, like a piece of clothing on them. And this is to where it got. So you had them going around the Kaaba, you had them maybe be going between Safa and Marwa, but the actual of what Allah, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted this to be like was totally gone now, okay? And so we established also, or we talked about last week, uh, that soothsayers were very prominent, that people, diviners were very um, um, prominent. Astrology was very prominent. So they were a polytheistic, idolatrous, and superstitious um, nation, right? And they also, this, um, this thing dealing with these arrows. So they would pull these arrows if they wanted to make a major decision on something, um, they would pull these arrows and these arrows would like, if it said yes, they would go ahead and do it. If they pulled another kind of arrow and it said no, they would wait a year to do it. And um, they made a lot of subhanAllah. And as we get on, I think um, we may be able to talk about it in this class. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi father almost lost his life as a result of this dealing with this superstition. Right. So. It's important for us to understand, um, once again, prior to Islam, the whole makeup of Arabia. And it also gives uh, the, the miracle of, of the Quran and the miracle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Islam is, is, is true. Because you have all of these tribes and these superstitions and this way of life and this belief. All of this stuff changes within the course of 23 years. Of, of them doing this stuff for over a thousand years, probably. And so, alhamdulillah, 
a whole mindset is changed. People are united where the tribes and the clans were something that meant everything. They had a saying that you uh, you uh, um, support your brother if he's the oppressor or if he's oppressed, right? And so they would intercede. The, the weak had no type of protection, no type of value. Women, for the most part, were looked at as like, and we know that they used to bury girls alive. It's like some type of shame towards the family. And so alhamdulillah, it's important to understand where they were and then how Islam came to actually liberate them physically, spiritually, emotionally, judicially. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Islam had liberated them. And so we also know in the in the Medina, particularly, the Jews had a, a strong hold in Medina. And so how did the Jews end up coming to that part of the, in the Hijaz, that part of the, the world in the first place? We know that they... Um, have always been people that have been um, kicked out of different places. You understand? And then they actually, the first phase was uh, was a destruction of a temple in Babylon. And then they left uh, Palestine for Hejaz and they settled in the northern areas. So they settled in, around in Medina. The second phase comes when the Roman occupation of Palestine under the le leadership of the Romans and this is around 70 AD. And this resulted in a tidal wave of Jews migrating to Hijaz, Yathrib, Haybar, Ta uh, uh, Tama, and uh, to places like that particularly. And then um, they end up building, they got, they got really established there, right? So they built forts and they built castles and they lived in villages. And they also had a very important role in pre-Islamic political life. Right. They used to look at the Arabs like savages because, number one, regardless, the Jews were on. They had an understanding that they didn't worship idols. And so they understood the, the how how crazy it was for people to to worship idols. And a lot, they can some of them a lot of times could read. So the Arabs, a lot of times were for the most part, a lot of them were illiterate. They didn't know how to read. They didn't know how to write. And um, but they have phenomenal memories because of the thing dealing with poetry and being able to remember to memorize poetry. And so they are uh, some of the, the famous Jewish uh, tribes that settled in northern Arabia and the Medina area. We know uh, Banu al-Mustalik, Banu Nadir, Quraidah and Banu Kainuka. All right. And they said some of them even counted as many as about 20 Jewish tribes that settled in that area. So now, now we have Judaism in that part of the world in the north. And then where did Christianity come from? So we had more so Christianity as it related to in Yemen. And so that followed uh, under Roman uh, colonialists in that particular country and Abyssinia. Abyssinia, as we know, remember, and the Joshi, the king whom the Muslims had went to for asylum. And he was this, they were a Christian nation. And so uh, Abyssinians, the Romans, they had um, some influence as it relates to um, uh, propagating Christianity in these particular areas. They had even built a church and they called it Yemeni al Kaaba. And as we get further on, we'll understand that the hatred that this particular person had for the Kaaba in Mecca and wanted to rival it is it related to the Christian um, faith? And so they, um, and we know that they made an attempt, Abraha is the person made an attempt in order to try to destroy the Kaaba. So some of the principal tribes that embraced um, Christianity was Ghassan, Taqlib, and Tai, and um, some Himalite kings, as well as other tribes living on the borders of the Roman Empire. And Alhamdulillah, this is one of the reasons as we get, I'm skipping a, along a little bit, but when the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam and the Sahaba go to fight in Tabuk, these particular tribes that bordered these areas in terms of like with Syria and stuff like that was talking mad stuff about Islam and like they was going to do something to, to the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam. So, so the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam was being proactive and he wanted to go deal with it before they could attack him. But these are the tribes, these Hassan, Tahlib, these people, you understand, had accepted Christianity and more so were like, eh, you know, puppets. 
you know, the Roman people really didn't respect them that much. It was like they made treaties with them and then they were going ahead and they would say, OK, we we are with these people. You understand what I mean? So, you know, alhamdulillah, we can kind of uh, in, in our times, you know, a person affiliated with a powerful gang. You understand? They may not necessarily it might be a, a sub thing of it. But it's like, you know, we with these people in order to try to give them some type of importance. Right. So another um, religion you had was Magianism. And this was popular uh, um, with some Yemens and also in terms of uh, the uh, Persian occupation as well. So they practiced that religion in Persia, Iraq, Bahrain. Um, and alhamdulillah, you, uh, some of us who are familiar with the Hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that everybody born is a Muslim. And it's their parents that turned them into a Sabian or a Jew or a Christian or Magian. So Alhamdulillah is a Magian. And if I'm not mistaken, Magians used to worship fire. This is a, a religion that Salman al farsi that we talked about in the stories of the Sahaba, he came from, that originally, because he was from Persia, he came from that particular um, religion. Okay, then Sabians, is another religion, these are more so the Chaldean people, this is popular in Yemen and Syria. And um, they kind of like kind of phased out. So they started to embrace other new religions and it kind of mixed with the Magians and they were in Iraq and the uh, Arabian Gulf area. Um, so the area was known to have these religions, but they didn't really practice any of them. And it became some that was traditional and then they were more so kind of anti-practice. So subhanAllah, I mean, kind of the situation we in now, right? Yeah, I, I'm believing this. I do this, I do that. But, you know, I only do this at this particular time. They're not necessarily religious people. And then more so they think was about immorality and trying to stick themselves in a, um, to stick themselves in some form of belief system, but didn't really believe or practice any of it, right? So, it's important for us also to understand the social life of Arabs. And actually, women were kind of uh, considerably portioned of kind of free will. And her uh, decision would be more so enforced. Um, and she was cherished to the point where blood would be uh, spilled in defense of her honor. OK, but do not get this twisted. This was a patriarchal society. And then a marriage contract, she couldn't resist that. Her father said she was marrying somebody, whoever her garden was, was marrying somebody, and that's what it was going to be, right? She couldn't question it, just what it was, that's the end of it. And Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given women, one of the, the, the freedoms that Allah had given women was the fact that they could choose, refuse who they wanted to marry, right? So no more forced marriages. Another thing, that uh, in that type of situation, subhanAllah, and this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about as to who you can who you can marry and who you cannot marry, right? Because if, uh, say for instance, if a son died, then his father got to inherit his wife, right? So she, like she was a piece of property. So also prostitution was rampant and in full operation. So Abu Darda, and now listen to this, Abu Darda narrates from Aisha Relata Anha, where she said there was four types of marriages. So the first type was a regular one, which is a man gives uh, his daughter in marriage, and there's a dowry that's agreed upon, and then they get married. The second one is that the husband would send his wife after, she men after her menstrual period to cohabitate with another man in order to conceive. After conception, her husband would, if he desired, have sexual intercourse with her. Allah knows best as to why that would happen, but this is one of the ways that they looked that this was a marriage. The third kind was that a group of no less than 10 men would have sexual intercourse with a woman. If she conceived and gave birth to a child, then she would send for these men who she had sex with. These 10 men, you know, maybe it was seven you know, maybe it's up to 10. And then she would say, you know what? It's like, it was, uh, you know, you the father. <laughs> she, she would look at, they would all come there. She knew, I guess, who she had sex with. And then she would come there and she would say, you know, you the father and you know what you did. I gave birth to a child and they point to the man and the dude would accept it. 
You know, alhamdulillah. I mean, that, I mean that's not alhamdulillah, but that's, that's what they would do, you know? And then the fourth kind was just basically, she just was like a, she just was like a whore. That's the fourth kind of thing. She would, pre she wouldn't prevent herself from anybody. She would plant a flag at her gates of her thing. All of the men could come in and have sex with her. There was no unlimited, there was an, uh, there was no limit to it. And then these men would go on ahead. And then what she would do when she became pregnant and she gave birth to the child, she would see it like a seeress. So remember, we talked about how um, they were into these diviners and all of this stuff, type of stuff. She would call this, call, call, she would call her and she would tell who the child was, who the father was. And then, um, you know, they, they would accept it. You know, they would accept it as they own. So, of course, we know that Islam um, took away all of these kinds of marriages except for the first one, where a father gives his daughter a way of marriage. There's a dowry been set. And alhamdulillah, that's, that's what that is. OK, so adultery prevailed and uh, among all social classes, except for a few men and women. So subhanAllah, you know, this unfortunate behavior was very rampant in a society. And they had, um, you know, we like we talked about, they held their kids very near and dear to them, but they used to bury their female daughters alive, you know, with this fear of poverty and shame that weighed on them for doing this. And alhamdulillah, once again, we know that uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam through his sunnah, as it relates to um, the uh, benefit of a person's afterlife, the akhirah, is attached to or can be attached to that it, as it relates to raising Muslim girls and having them, raising them a certain type of way. And we know that one time the Prophet Wasallam was praying and a girl didn't say a baby. There's a reason why they said a little girl was on his back. And so that was a big thing. So the Prophet Wasallam was breaking this taboo as it related to women and girls. Okay. So the Bedouins, um, deep-seated emotional attachment to his clan. And so this was a really big thing for them. Tribal pride, one of the strongest passions with them, the doctrine of unity, blood as a principle of the bounded Arabs of social unity and form that supported their tribe. The undisputed model was, like I said, support your brother if he's an oppressor or being oppressed. And this was literal. And they, and of course, it's a hadith that says that, and they asked the Prophet of Islam, how can we support? And he said that you encourage the person not to do it. You understand what I mean? And we know we can intervene. Like, man, what is you doing? No, we don't, you're not going to do that. We Muslim, we're not going to do that. And so a time-honored custom also was um, they suspended hostilities in the prohibited months. So our prohibited months are what? The sacred months, Muharram, Rajab, Dhul, uh, uh, Dhul Qada, and Dhul Hijjah. And this was a function favorably and provided an opportunity for them to earn a living to coexist in peace. <laughs> they was fighting each other all the time. They had to come up with something like, man, we got to earn a living. So these particular uh, months and to them were um, prohibited months as it related to fighting. OK, so. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's family. Banu Hashim. And this was um, after uh, his grandfather, um, uh, Abdul Manaf. So Hashim Abdul Manaf was the Prophet Islam's grandfather. Um, and previously mentioned, he was responsible for giving food and water to the pilgrims. So the Prophet Islam, as we know, comes from this very prestigious, very well-regarded tribe from Quraysh because Quraysh had all of these different sub um, tribes. Banu Hashim is very part of the Quraysh, right? And so his grandfather was responsible for giving food and water into the pilgrims, something very prestigious, very important, had a name for himself as it related to this particular thing. Because remember, you had Arabs from and tribes from all over the peninsula that would come. And then you got this person, he's responsible, he's the man responsible for giving food and water to the pilgrims, right? So he was wealthy, he was honest. Um, he was the first, and it said, uh, uh, first to offer pilgrims sop bread with broth. And his name was Amr, 
but he was called Hashem because he had been in a practice of crumbling bread for the pilgrims. He was also the first man who started Quraysh's two journeys of summer and winter. Okay, so getting to Abdul Muttalib, he took over and he managed um, to maintain his people's prestige. And he outdid his, his, uh, his grandfather's and the honorable behavior, which gained in, in Mecca's deep love and high esteem. So they were very well known for being hospitable. And Abdul Muttalib, he witnessed two important events in his lifetime namely the digging Zamzam well and the elephant raid. And it says in brief that he received an order in his dream to dig Zamzam well in a particular place. And he did that and found things that Jurhon men had buried therein when they were forced to evacuate in Mecca. And he found swords and armor and two deer uh, and the two deer of gold and the gate of the Kaaba was stamped from the gold swords and the two deer then the tradition of providing Zamzam water to pilgrims was established. So that's just a little fun fact um, <clears throat> to know. The second event that he did was uh, he witnessed, we know al Abraha, Al-Habashi, the Abyssinian, the Ethiopian, and uh, who was from Yemen, and he had seen that the Arabs made their pilgrimage to Kaaba, so he built a large church, like I said, in Sanaa, and um, in order to attract, so that the the um, his goal was to take people away from the Kaaba and to attract them to Yemen to this big church that he built. Like he said, he called it El Kaaba Yemeni El Kaaba or Kaaba El Yemeni. This is what he called it. And when that didn't work, his thing was to go and try to destroy the Kaaba. You know what I mean? And so. He goes in there with these elephants. This is something that they were not necessarily used to seeing. We know how strong elephants are. And he continued to march and he mobilized his army and he got almost on the, uh, the ready to enter Mecca. And we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent these birds and the birds had stones. And if when you drop anything, if a, you know it's like a bullet, you ever see where they say something that go up, got to come down. Uh, but people don't understand when you shoot a, a bullet in the air, it could be just as vicious when it go because it got to come down from somewhere. That bullet could be just as vicious and kill somebody when it comes down. So think about when you have these um, these rock size, uh, these, these rock size uh, pieces of rock and it's these birds and they were real high up. And there was probably thousands of them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent thousands of them, these birds. And they dropped these things and it was tearing the flesh off of Abraha's army. And a lot of them ended up, of course, they retreated. And, they, and some of this stuff, they, the, the wounds and stuff got affected and they ended up dying in a miserable state for trying to do that. You know, um, so at another event happened that was we've all been waiting for getting to this part. During um, the year of the elephant, this is when our beloved Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born. 571. Some people say 570, 571. It's not a big deal. You know what I mean? But this is the, the year of the elephant. And um, this was 50, uh, 55 days before the birth of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. So it says it, it corresponds between February and March of 571. Okay. So. What happens is that um, Abyssinia maintained a strong ties with the Romans. Remember, the Romans was a Byzantine empire. Abyssinia was a Christian nation. And um, <laughs> they heard about this thing that happened with these elephants. And this just added more prestige and the sacredness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's house, al Kaaba. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi father, his father's name was Abdullah. And he was the smartest of Abdul uh, of um, Abdul Muttalib's son. He was the, um, the most loved by him as well, too. And so now listen to this to show you how deep this uh, superstition went with them. We always hear about girls being buried alive, which was a horrible thing. But they also you would if they made a particular vow, they would also do something in terms of maybe sacrificing one of their kids and it could have been a boy. This was the situation as it related to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's own father. 
And so he um, he had made this vow. He had 10 children. And he goes, um, in terms of these deviation of arrows again, and it, po- and it, and it uh, pointed at being slaughtered as a sacrifice to the Kaaba. Okay? And so he goes... And he's getting ready to sacrifice the Prophet Sallallahu taking him to the Kaaba. It was a, he made a, um, this vow when they became older. So it wasn't like they were babies when he was getting ready. He was old, he was older and he never said anything to it, but he was going to be obedient to what he vowed because this is something a lot of them, they kept their word. So he goes and he uh, takes him to al Kaaba to sacrifice him to the goddess of Hubal. You know, and uh, when he was getting ready to do it, uh, Abu Talib actually stepped in and also Banu Makhzum stepped in and they tried to dissuade him from doing this. So what they what did they do? They called a she diviner. Once again, these are people who supposedly have this power to be able to have this communication with Allah, the unseen. So he called, they call this diviner, right? And the diviner comes up once again with the deviation of the arrows thing again. Once, so what is that? That's a refresher. This is when they would make these um, choices based upon whatever came out from these arrows. And so her thing was, she added that drawing the lot should be repeated 10 more camels every time he drew um, an arrow showing that to be sacrificed for Abdullah. Every time they drew these arrows, it was saying, yep, kill him. Yep, kill him. Yep, kill him. It repeated it so much. Now, remember, she said every time that you draw a, um, an arrow and it says to kill him, you got to do more or sacrifice them, you got to pull and and sacrifice or, you know, 10 more camels. So he got all the way up to a hundred camels. So that's how many times that his name came up on these arrows for him to be killed, to be sacrificed. So it got up to a hundred arrows. I'm sorry. It got up to a hundred camels to be sacrificed. And so they sacrificed them. And this is for the satisfaction of Hobal and not for his sons. So they left the, you know, he slaughtered them. They left the meat for birds, humans, whoever wanted to eat it. And what this actually did, this incident changed because we'll get into blood money, which is more so you kill somebody and then the family can offer a certain amount of comp- money compensation. However, they, they did it in camels, which was currency. OK, so what they did is that this actually changed because blood money used to be 10 camels and this changed the whole thing as it related to now you kill somebody you uh, the blood money was 100 camels okay so abdul uh, mutalib he chose amina um who was the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's mother he chose him to um her you know to marry abdullah and alhamdulillah um she marries him and they weren't married for a long period of time, but they were married long enough to for her to get pregnant. And as we know that the Prophet Sallallahu father, or maybe we didn't know, the Prophet Sallallahu father, he dies. His father sends him out on a mission to go by dates in Medina. He ends up dying and um, Amina is devastated by these, the, this news. So she's pregnant. And, you know, I, just to get off um, a little subject a little bit in terms of dealing with this book. All she had left, he didn't leave her a lot of stuff. So she had five camels, a small number of goats, um, and then the she servant, Baraka, Um Ayman, and who would later serve as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's nursemaid. Now, this is something, this is, a, this is an issue that I have a, a sometimes a problem with these books. Because there is a very intimate connection, as we talked about Baraka, or or better, or also known as Um Ayman, that this connection that she has with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's um, mother and with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself, whom he called the mother after his mother, because they act like, oh, she was a slave. She used to be a slave. She was his nursemaid, and she was there for him, and that's it. No, they had a very 
deep relationship, a connection. The Prophet Sallallahu loved Um Ayman. He loved Barakah. He loved her son, Usama. He loved her husband, Zayd Ibn Haritha. So there is a, a deep connection. So trying to go off of that just a little bit, I want for us who are listening to this and we are learning this, I want you to understand Um Ayman was an Abyssinian black woman whom the Prophet Sallallahu called the mother after his mother. OK, so a lot of times when you read about the Sira of the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, they don't really talk about her a lot. They talk about Zaid, they talk about Usama, but they don't talk about how she was with the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam from the time he was born all the way until his death. And the deep and the, the relationship, the deep connection and the relationship that they have with one another. OK, so I want to go ahead and just and, and, and come with that. So, inshallah. Um, okay, yeah. All right, well, inshallah, we can keep going. So, the Prophet Sallallahu Wasallam, he was um, born, like I said, in Rabia Wall in the same year of the elephant. And also, there's there's some things in a book that I can't, um, I, I don't know if it's true or not. So, I, I'm not going to say it. But I know that there, this part is, is that his mother had a dream that light had had come from her. And, and Um Ayman has said it, subhanAllah, this is something that is, you know, you're going to be blessed. And she knew she was pregnant. She was the first person she confided in, told her that she was pregnant. And um, she tells Abdul Muttalib that she's pregnant. And he goes and he, and what she has, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he circumcised him on the seventh day, and this was the custom of the Arabs, okay? So the first woman who suckled the Prophet wasallam after his mother was a woman named Thuyiba, and she was the concubine of Abu Lahab. With her son, we know that Abu Lahab was the uncle of the Prophet wasallam, and she also suckled Hamza ibn um, Abdul Muttalib. So they, not only was that his uncle, but now that's his um his suckling brother as well, right? And so one of the things in general, it was a custom of the Arabs living in the towns that they would send their kids to Bedouin nurses so that they might grow up in free, healthy surroundings of the desert. It's funny because they considered like Mecca the city and stuff like that, something that we would never during that time would think about that. But they wanted to, them to get out of the city. And this was a tradition that these women would come and they would um, take these kids and they would be wet nurses for them. And they would have this beautiful speech and the manners of the Bedouins. And it was both noted, the Bedouins were noted for their chastity of their language um, and being free from those vices, which usually develop kind of a sedentary um, society, subhanAllah. You know, you think about, I know I was telling my children one time that it was very popular um, in African-American communities as in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And I'm sure even before that, that when black people started to or African-Americans started to migrate to the, to the north, that a lot of times they had a lot of families in the south. Right. And so you have people who are living in New York or Chicago or Cleveland or something like that. And in the summertime, a lot of times what families would do is that they would send their kids down south. Right. They are now fishing. They get the country life. It's not uh, it's, it's kind of slow down there. You can stay out of trouble. All of these different things. So I kind of look at it almost like that. They got them out of the city. They're getting these these manners, uh, the, the lifestyle, you know, not being able to just sitting around being lazy. So they're in this particular situation. And so, alhamdulillah, the person who ends up getting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in this situation is a woman named Halima. Right. And her um, husband's name was um, Al Harith bin Abdul Uzza, right? So the traditions um, related to Halima of her household was favored uh, by uh, strokes of good fortune while the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was with under her care. Now, what's interesting is is that um, a lot of these women would come to Mecca. They're looking for kids to um, to suckle. And nobody wanted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi You understand? Why did they not want the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Because he was an orphan. 
and they more so look for the father to compensate them. And remember, they weren't necessarily considered very rich um, people when the Prophet Sallallahu father had passed away. So she comes, and this is like the, the year of the drought and famine, <laughs> and there's nothing that they really had to eat. So she rode on a real um, emaciated looking donkey, um, and they had an old she camel, and it didn't have, it wouldn't produce any type of milk, right? And it said that the child was crying all night. Her own child would be crying all night on the, on, on the account of being hungry. And she didn't even have enough um, milk in her breast, you understand, to, to feed her own child. And the, and the she camel had nothing either. So they would uh, pray for rain, you know, because we know if it rains, vegetation grows, the animals can eat, and then therefore, inshallah, the milk can be produced. So it said that she basically uh, was kind of by default went to and accepted the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And because she, all of the women had came back with kids and she did not want to come back without a child. So she, her and her husband somewhat kind of reluctantly took the Prophet Wasallam. And immediately when she did that, the Prophet Wasallam immediately, he took to her and her, her, her breasts and stuff became extremely full. And um, then it was enough milk. And also um, her foster brother and both of them, they went to sleep from being able to be um, fed sufficiently. And then it says that her husband went to the she camel and it was filled with milk, All right? And then she milked it and they drank till they filled too. And they also had, uh, life just got better. The next morning by Allah Halima, it said, you must understand. Now they understood that there was a correlation between what was going on and who they just got as a baby. So they held on to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam you know, as long as they particular as they could. So they were enjoying all of these different, um, you know, like to use the word, they use the word fortune. We don't believe in good luck, but there was a lot of good things that was happening to them. And the, the donkey that she had rode initially was now strong. You understand? I mean, it didn't look all a uh, uh, messed up like it did before. It was fast. And um, the people around her knew that she had a, uh, had a blessed child too. And so when they had reached, uh, certain parts of the land, not only did they themselves started to benefit, but that land that was barren, now all of a sudden it came with grass, it had animals that started coming back to it, and the animals was filled with milk. And it said that the Prophet ﷺ stayed with her for at least two years. And this is um as they weaned, as Halima said, they took her back to, uh, to his mother, and they were uh, they were really trying to convince her, please let him stay with us. Let him stay with us. You know what I mean? We can take care of him. You don't have to worry about it. And the, and the excuse that they used was that there was a, um, there was a, a, a some type of um, uh, like a plague that could hit that area that was well known. And so they were saying, well, listen, the plague is in this area. Let's, we can take him back, get him out of this situation and keep him safe. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he stayed with them until he was four or five years old in age. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, and this is from Anas, may Allah be pleased with him as Sahih Muslim. He narrates that Jabril came down and he ripped open the chest and took out the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's heart. Now he's seeing this and then he's, he extracted a blood cloud out of it. And he said, this was the part of shaitan in thee. And then it was washed with Zamzam in a gold basin. And after that, the heart was joined together and restored to his place. The boys and the playmates came running to his mother and his nurse and said, Verily, Muhammad وسلم, has been murdered. They all rushed towards him and found him all night. Um, he, they was, he was okay. And his face was extremely white. Okay. So after this event, Halima became very worried. And then she ends up taking him back to his mother and he was six. He was around six years old. Okay. So Alhamdulillah, um, out of respect for her husband, she wanted to go visit his grave where he was buried in, in Yathrib. 
and it took her a long period of time. She went with Um Ayman, and she went with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and um, and her father-in-law Abdul Muttalib too. And she spent a month there, and then took her way back to Mecca. And then she became severely ill, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's mother had passed away. Okay, so Alhamdulillah, Inshallah, we're going to stop there. Um, if there is any um, comment or questions, Inshallah. Please feel free to do so now. Hey, one of the sisters on Facebook says, so his parents were not Muslim. No, his parents weren't Muslim. No, his parents weren't Muslim. This is before Islam. And they, uh, even though it's like, <laughs> subhanAllah, uh, even though his father's name was Abdullah, you know, but once again, you know, subhanAllah, he, he, he was, uh, he wasn't a Muslim, you know, he didn't believe, and there was no evidence that he didn't believe in, uh, strictly in the, um, religion of Ismail alayhi salam, and neither did his mother. So no, neither one of his parents were, um, were Muslim. Okay, another question is, he got along with Abu Lahab at this time? Okay, so remember, I want everybody to remember something. Prior to Islam, his name wasn't Abu Lahab. And because of the fact that the Abu Lahab ends up, he gets this title from the surah in the Quran, right? So we, and also it's the same thing as Abu Jahal. Abu Jahal, his name was, um, uh, I can't remember Abu Lahab's name right now. But um, Abu Hakam was was uh, was Abu Jahal's name. So remember, this is prior to Islam. So they weren't hostile to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, they they you know they were cool with him. You know, it was his uncle. It was one of the um, it was Abu Talib's brother, uh, Hamza's brother. You understand what I mean? So they were they were cool with him. And and then as we go along, inshallah, we'll see how respected. And love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with these people who are enemies to him, how much they respected and loved him prior to Islam. So they he got along with him because there was no opposition. You know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say he was the messenger of Allah yet. He wasn't calling people away from idols. He wasn't calling people away from these horrible traditions that they have with these animals and these deviation of arrows and the soothsayers and the diviners. He wasn't doing any of that yet. Right. So there was no reason for them to have um, any type of uh, hostility towards him. I think that what the authors do is they give you they refer to these people's Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, just for, so we can understand who they were. But no, they had different names and they were not hostile to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, what I mean, before that, you know, it's interesting because um, they when when they were trying to come up with uh, slandering the Prophet Wasallam. it was difficult for them to try to come up with something because he was preaching to people as they came to Hajj. It was difficult for them to try to come up with something because his reputation was so good. He was not prior to Islam. He was known as El Amin, the trustworthy. You know, so they try to say he was crazy. They knew they really couldn't say that. They try to say he was a magician or a sorcerer. He had no type of history of doing it. people who were sorcerers and magicians and and astrologers they had a reputation and were very well known for doing this type of stuff so it's not like he was doing it in secret and they wouldn't have knew about it so it was very difficult for them to come up with something to even slander his character i mean they did it anyway but they had to take counsel it wasn't easy for them to do that so um yeah so but for the most part this was his family so they they had no reason. He just was existing and in, in a society. He never worshiped idols. He, he wasn't into that. He never did any of this haram, immoral behavior that the people were into. And, you know, but they respected him. And he, you know, it was his family. He got along with them. Yeah, the sister said that was her next question. So the family didn't take him to worship the idols or nothing like that. They didn't force that on him at that time in his life. 
No, 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 no. He he stayed away from that. Remember, subhanAllah, his heart was cleansed when he was a little boy. The angel Jabril came and he cleansed his heart of all of that type of stuff. He didn't join on any. He was like five years old when that happened, you know, and um, and he, he took they said this is shaitan. He took that out. And he didn't have any inclination towards any of that stuff. And, you know, there was a couple of different people who didn't do that. I, Abu Bakr was another one. It, there was no evidence that Abu Bakr worshipped idols either. And remember when he would, the, well, as we, inshallah, I keep saying remember, like everybody um, knows this stuff. But as we get along further, inshallah, we will see how the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his first revelation, which is actually Surah Al-Iqra, his first revelation, he had he would go and um, go into seclusion away from people as they was doing all of this stuff, you know. So no, they didn't they didn't force him to to uh, worship idols either. Okay, my mother from Facebook says you made me think that I was there. Such a good storyteller. Bless you and your family, Mukhtar. Amen. And may Allah Amen. grant you paradise. Amen. 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 Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Any questions or comments in Zoom? Go ahead. Take the mic. Uh, so okay. go back to the. Okay. As oh. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Yeah, you was talking about the, the day of the elephant. And uh, could you go back over that part with, uh, what is it, Amahar, whatever his name is, that tried yeah. to build this big church. Mm -hmm. And I guess what he was trying to do was to make the people stop going to Mecca. Was that going around the Kaaba? He wanted the people to come there to right. uh, bring all their money there. Is that what that problem was? Um, was I, you know, yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I, it's not only with money, but the whole thing of, of Mecca was prestige as well. I mean, you know, you got to remember, you got a hundred, let's say a hundred thousand people converging on one particular place. So you have that, you got the prestige, you got the money coming to you, you got all of these different types of things. So yeah, he hated the, the, the situation dealing with the Kaaba. So he, to the point where he built, they built this, this big, huge church, and it wasn't getting to play like the Kaaba was getting. So his thing was to go and destroy the Kaaba, <laughs> you know. And alhamdulillah, I, even though that it's, it's interesting because even though that they were idol worshippers, uh, Abdul Muttalib was an idol worshipper. They were all running away. He And it was like defending. Dude, well, you're not going to defend the Kaaba? He said Allah got that. And Allah, he was absolutely right. You know what I mean? But yeah, Abraham was a he was a uh, Abyssinian. You know, and a lot of them, if you look at the um, the uh, map, it's right across the water for the most part. That's why they had, it was easy for the Muslims to go to Abyssinia to seek asylum. Because it's not, it was, you know, I mean, in terms of far for them. But if you look at it, the closer, a lot of people don't give the credit, like Sudan, how close it is to the Arabian Peninsula, how close um, Ethiopia was to the Arabian Peninsula. So over the course of time, these Abyssinians had started a, a real stronghold in, in Yemen, right? And so a lot of the Yemenis who are Arabs would come to the Kaaba in terms of the pilgrimage and stuff like that every year, if that's what they did. And he got, he got mad about that. I mean, that angered him. So his thing was to try to destroy the Kaaba. Mm -hmm. So the pebbles that the birds brought, uh, I guess they were, I know they, that's like a soldier from Allah, right? Those, yeah. those birds that brought the, the pebbles? Absolutely. So I'm assuming that, and I shouldn't assume, but um, those birds was probably maybe different from birds that we know, right? Oh, uh, well, you know, they was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what I mean? So as far as um, they they did what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them to do. But I, I've seen some uh, pictures of, you no, know, some of them birds still exist today. You know, they had birds, you know, like I said, it probably, it could have been thousands of them. And if they got um, stuff in their hands, I mean, I'm sorry, in their claws or whatever, and they had a high altitude and they start dropping it. You know, I mean, that part, that anybody is done from that. It's like if you want to like Empire State Building and you, and you drop uh, 
you know, drop a rock on somebody, even if it's small, you might kill them. Yeah. You know, something from high up. So I've I've seen pictures of somebody. Oh, these was the birds that Allah sent. Um, and inshallah, maybe what I can do, I'll research it and then I'll put I'll post it so everybody can see what they look like. Um, but yeah, it wasn't not like a special type of big bird or anything like that. They were normal birds. Mm-hmm. They just was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do what they did. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank As-salamu alaykum. Wa alaykum rahmatullah. I just wanted to say jazakallahu khairan for taking the time to teach us this. You know, most of us... Alhamdulillah. Most of us who, um, you know, who grew up Muslim, you know, we hear these stories, you know, throughout our lifetime. But I like the fact that you are not just given the story. You're, you're given the history of the place. You're given the history of the people. That's what's left out. And I think that's so important. So, mashallah, you're doing a very good job. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Shukran. Jazakallah khair. Wa yaka. alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. I am, uh, this is so interesting as always, and so uh, informative knowledge that we need to know. Um, so I was thinking of the, the, the married couple. I was thinking of the, the, the woman who nursed him. Mm. She, uh, she wasn't, she wasn't a Baraka, was she? No, 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 it's, too, it's a different person. Yeah, yeah Halima. Halima. Was, I thought it was different uh, mm-hmm. because I'm trying to write down their names, take notes, and write down their names as we go along. And uh, mm-hmm. it's it's amazing how how she, and how she took care of him, you know, for mm-hmm. at least five years of his life. And mm-hmm. and when the the angels came and cleaned him, of course, I had heard that before. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And. Um, so it was it was amazing how she she had no milk or anything for her even her own child, right. you know. But Allah wa Taala provided, right? You know, that's for right. all of them, right? You know? Alhamdulillah. Yeah, that's right. I mean, so he had two wet nurses, uh, Abu Lahab's concubine. That seemed like that was a short period of time, and then he ends up with Halima, you know, and um, he was with her for a, a while, you know, like you said, he was with her for a while. And alhamdulillah, not just, I mean, the whole area was was blessed, not just her and her household, but they said when he was around, land was was uh, became luxurious and bees started coming back. Because, of course, as we know, wherever there's, you know, grass, because that's what a lot of the animals eat, right? Wherever there's grass, if there's rain, if there's grass, then there, the animals are going to come back and they're going to eat it. The animals eat it. They become full. We can we kill them. We eat them. We milk them. However, we do it. You understand what I mean? So, alhamdulillah, even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being around particular areas, that area had even started to benefit being around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being in that in that area. Alhamdulillah. So, you know, I, and, and I, I really do, alhamdulillah, I want everybody to think, as we're talking about pre-Islam, I want everybody to think that this, I, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing to me, because 23 years, a lot of us have been alive way longer than 23 years, and the, and the things that we're listening to, um, the things that we're hearing about how the society was for a thousand years, you know, 500 years, 100 years, right? These traditions and stuff like that was all broken. And only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do something like that. Something that stands upon the truth could do something like that. Anything in terms of falsehood uh, could, could never do anything like that. And that's why I think part of our society is so messed up because they're going away and they're making things up as they go along. But alhamdulillah, we have proof that our way of life can fix a whole entire society, even if it's been around for a thousand years. And the stuff that they were doing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can, can fix this because this is the truth. You understand what I mean? So um, I think about the, the women, the, the astrology, the superstition, the, you know, uh, um, pr- protecting people um, who didn't have any tribes and things of that nature. You know, alhamdulillah, these things... It doesn't seem like a big deal to us now, but these things were revolutionary. Revolution. A woman can own property. A woman can inherit money. 
he could say, no, nah, no, nah, I don't want to marry that person. <laughs> I'm not trying to do that. I'm not trying to marry that person. And she, she could do that. You don't have your burying people. A woman in terms of some type of honor, planting a flag and having different men come and sleep with her. You know, subhanAllah, you know, Islam did away with all the, and more as we get along, inshallah, as we get along further, we'll see more and more how Islam um, liberated um, the society. You understand what I mean that it was in? Anything else? Okay, alhamdulillah. So inshallah, uh, I will see everyone again on Sunday as we talk about the stories of the Sahaba. Inshallah, I'm going to do 10 more Sahaba, and then inshallah, we're going to um, bring that to a close, inshallah. So um, the intention is Sunday at 6 o'clock. Um, anybody that got anything good from this is definitely from Allah. And any mistake that was made is from me, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive me for it. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik wa ashadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.